Thank you so much for taking time to listen to today's message. We really hope it encourages you. And if you want to listen to more, check us out at faithfellowshipchurch.net. But for now, let's jump into today's message. And um, it reminded me of a story recently. I was at the YMCA, and a friend of mine told me this story. He was working out, and he says, I got I to tell you something, a funny thing that happened to me. I said, well, go ahead. He goes, well, he said, I have some old relatives that are 100 years old and older, and and we were talking about life, and they didn't know that my wife had died of cancer. And so they went, he went to see them, and they were talking about it, and these old relatives that kn- knew her said, well, how is so-and-so doing? I'm not going to say the name because you, m- you might remember or recognize it. They said, how is so-and-so doing? And he says to them, oh, I'm sorry you didn't know. Uh, she went to see the Lord. And then they said, oh, that's good. She always did want to travel. <laughs> and uh, so we both cracked up and, and just laughed our heads off. And it was good for him to see the humor. But it reminded me that when we worship like we did this morning, it's just a small taste. It's just a small sliver of what God has in store for us and what God wants to do. And I think he allows us a little glimpse through a glass dimly, as the scripture says, of what it's going to be like to just step into the presence of God, see him face to face, and worship with all the elders, bowing our faces before the Lord, singing, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And so uh, with that, I want to look at our scripture this morning. But you have been chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness. Can you say amen? Amen. Into his wonderful light, say amen. Amen. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. When I look at that passage of scripture, I remember my past growing up. I didn't know it then, but as I read this scripture, I I see what God was doing back in the 1970s, late 60s, early 70s. My mom is here this morning, and I'm so glad about that. She's my greatest cheerleader. She said, anytime you're going to speak, I want to be there. That's what moms do, right? But as I thought about this verse, and I didn't realize it then as I was growing up, that this scripture was talking about the fact that God was able to call us royal priesthood. God was able to call us priests before God, that we had a complete and total access to God in his presence. Anytime, any place, and any one of us. And it was just this mind-blowing reality and revolution that Jesus introduced in the New Testament. We know in the Old Testament didn't quite look like that. But in the early 70s and late 60s, God began to fulfill what I think was this scripture saying, I'm going to pour out my spirit on men. I'm going to pour out my spirit on women. I'm going to pour out my spirit on the rich and the poor and the young and the old. I'm going to pour out my spirit on the Presbyterians, on the Episcopalians. I'm going to pour out my spirit on, lo and behold, the Lutherans, those Norwegians. I'm going to, those stubborn Norwegians. I'm going to pour out my spirit on the Baptists, even. They called them Bapticostals. Baptists that were full of the Holy Spirit. And God was just going to do with anyone who was open. God was going to do with it at any place, any time. I remember in high school, Pastor Andy talked a little bit about the Jesus movement last week and sharing a little bit of his testimony. And I remember stories. God was moving in such a way, we actually had prayer meetings in high school. We would go to high school. And I remember going to this meeting, it's like, All these kids were in there. Remember that, Randy? I mean, all these kids were in there. We were praying, and God was just doing this stuff, and it was like we went to high school and went to prayer meeting before high school, and I specifically remember this situation. This is a long time ago. Don't think about it too much. 
I remember this specific girl. I think she was a year or two ahead of me in high school. And, and she, we were in this prayer meeting, and we were praying, and I, I knew that she, she was not the kind of type that really was walking with God from my perspective. You know, I was the pastor's kid, so I kind of knew all the scope that was going on in the school. I thought, you know, she was whatever. And all of a sudden, we were praying, and she just began to prophesy. And I went, I don't even know if she's really following Jesus and she's prophesying. I, I, don't, I don't think she, I was thinking, I was like, I, I want to prophesy. I, I'm doing better than she is. And I was thinking, God, you were fulfilling this royal priesthood thing that God was going to invite everybody that was hungry, everybody that was thirsty, everybody that was open to the presence of God and to the anointing of God and to the fullness of the Holy Spirit being poured out. God was going to invite everybody. I remember, Mom, those early years when I was a child growing up, and Diane remembers that we would have these meetings called Sing and Share, and people would come into different homes, our neighbors, our place, different places. Mark Milsick came to our house, got saved right there. God was doing things in places and with people and at times that it didn't matter. Any place, any time, with anyone, God was moving by his spirit. Can you say amen? And God was working, and we, we would be kids and we'd be worshiping, and we would go to sleep as the people would continue to worship into the night. Not with a bunch of instruments like this. Maybe, I think mom played the accordion a little bit, maybe maybe a little bit, and we had different things, but we just sang and worshiped the Lord, and the presence of God was so thick. The presence of God was so tangible, so real. Taste and see that the Lord was good was what was happening in those meetings. And I remember we would go to sleep, and they would just continue to worship. And it was young and old, male, female, black, white, red, white, yellow, whatever it was, and God was just inviting people in. During communion, I was running sound back there, and as soon as I took the bread this morning, I just began to tear up because I said, Jesus, this was your invitation for us to be priests, to be able to access the presence of God, I saw legs grow. I saw miracles. I saw words of knowledge. I've, I've been in meetings where people would share the things of the Spirit, information about people in a good way, in a, in a holy way, in a, in a balanced way. I saw people sharing things about their lives in youth meetings where they would speak out and say, this person right here, and they'd point out somebody, and they start with saying all the stuff that was going on in their life, and their eyes would get big, and all those kids in that meeting knew that Jesus was doing something supernatural, something miraculous, something was happening in the spiritual realm that nobody could explain other than it was Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit just doing what he does. As I think back, and as I Think of all those different things that happened. I remember the, the Millers. Remember them, Diane? Bobby Miller, um, Ed Miller. They brought to the Lutheran Church in Vinland up in Paulsville. Worship like I'd never seen ever before and like you have probably, most of you have never seen worship. They came from Argentina. There was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Revival was happening. They came here to this little Lutheran church with my farmer Lutheran little dad coming out to this Lutheran church and just began to see the outpouring of God in worship. I remember as a kid sitting there so full of joy. The joy was so big, so anonymous. It was so overwhelming that we would just laugh now, some of you know that it's, there's some weird stuff out there about laughing in the Spirit. I'm telling you, genuinely, I remember to this day in that meeting, sitting there, and the presence of God so strong that you would just begin to laugh because it was overwhelming. It wasn't weird. It wasn't strange fire. It was the true 
anointing of God, so heavy, so strong, you couldn't stand it. And I remember, as distinct as I'm saying out of my voice now, as a young kid, remembering that. Remember that, Mom? And I remember all the different, different characters that God was thinking of when he was thinking, I'm going to draw all people. And we had a man called Percy Guthridge. He's from England, and he had this proper way he said things. But yet was a great mentor to my, my dad. And we had all these different speakers in, and all this stuff was going on. I could go on and on and on. And Randy probably knows, and Diane and George, and different ones that were there for that process. All I'm here to say is, I didn't know it then. I couldn't connect that to this scripture. I couldn't connect it to the fact that God was saying, anyone, anyone, at any time, in any place, can encounter the presence of God because of what God has done through Jesus Christ. And we'll get to that in just a moment. Just think of that. I saw pe people were getting saved. People were getting touched by the Holy Spirit. It wasn't happening just in churches. It was happening in some living room. It was happening in some vehicle driving somewhere, and the presence of God would come. It was happening hiking out in the woods. God was also just showing up anytime, unexpectedly, in any place, and with any one. It was marvelous and amazing. And so when I was thinking about preparing for this and thinking about all this, this scripture, I was thinking, what a privilege and what a heritage Faith Fellowship has. Because what I saw, yes, people would be touched by just reading the word somewhere and just the Holy Spirit would fall, sometimes just in prayer. But predominantly what happened was in worship, like we did this morning, as people began to worship, the Holy Spirit began to flow and the anointing of the presence of God would come and you could feel not only that the fact that the Holy Spirit always lives in us, he indwells us, but there's a second part of what the Holy Spirit does is at times he comes in his manifest, meaning that's what happened at Pentecost. Those people were indwelt by the Spirit of God, but tongues of fire came upon them. In other words, the Spirit of God was for that moment in that place manifest in a way that went beyond what they were experiencing just in their heart. The presence of God came. And you have probably at times thought and felt that very presence coming. That's the manifest presence. And that's what faith fellowships, heritage was, is that we saw God do those kinds of things. We wanted people to experience what it was like to sense and feel and touch and see and taste the presence of God. And all those years that we existed, we were saying, if people could just know what it was like to step in the presence of God for a moment, everything would change. If people could just for a moment experience what it was like for the Spirit of God to rest upon them, come manifest and see healing, see deliverance, I remember this one time this guy came into our church setting and I, I felt the presence of God and I went up to him and I said, I believe my friend, my brother, that the chains are falling off you. And he'd used drugs for a long time. He was addicted to marijuana. And as I went up and I said, lay hands on him, the presence of God just fell on us both. We were just sitting there. I was just young pastor in the Lord. I was just praying for him and I looked at him and he was in tears and I said, did you feel that? He said, yeah. He said, I literally felt chains falling off of me. I felt the presence of God coming and delivering me in that very moment. And he said, it, it was kind of weird. And from that day forward, he served the Lord and never had a problem with marijuana again. That's the kind of thing that would happen and God would move. And it makes me hungry. I don't know about you. It makes me hungry. It makes me long for. It makes me want to press in. It makes me want to say, Lord, could, 
could you create that manifest presence? Could you bring with our hungry hearts a new awakening of the presence of God? As the priests of God realize as their identity that that's what we do. It's not just we come to do something because we do something on Sunday morning. We praise and worship because that's who we are as priests of God. It's out of who we are inside that we worship like that. We're not trying to accomplish something called worship. We're worshipers by who we are. And as that happens, the floodgates of the heavens are open and God begins to move and the presence of God comes and refreshes and brings life and hope and restoration and deliverance and healing and the gifts and the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Can you say amen? Well, it wasn't always that way, was it? I don't know how many of you read the chapter yet. It wasn't always that way in the Old Testament, right? God had set up what was called the Levitical priesthood. There was a tribe in Judah of of Israelites called Judah. They were the Levites, and they were the priests before God. If you read the chapter, God had separated them out, and they were the ones who stood between God and man. They drew people into the presence of God. They offered sacrifices so so people could stand before a holy God. They served as an in-between between between God and man. But it it wasn't always what God really wanted. He always, from the very beginning, if you could bring up that scripture in Exodus for me, Sarah. The scripture in Exodus. Even though he had set up In the Old Testament, a priesthood, and if you read the chapter, it explains it so well. I beg of you to read this chapter. It's life-changing. It explains it so much better than I can in just a few minutes. It says, now if you obey me and fully keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Isn't that good? Treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, and you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation's These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. Even though God had set apart people to be priests as as the go-between, God's real heart in Exodus was that we all, way back, even in the Old Testament, would individually respond from the heart to God and that we would all become priests. It wasn't going to happen until the New Testament, as we'll see in a moment, but this was God's heart. Bring up that passage in Jeremiah, Sarah, 31. I love this one, one of Randy, Pastor Randy's favorite scriptures, too. It says this in Jeremiah 31. It's coming, it's coming. Look at these words. This is the covenant that I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their mind. Whoops, back it up. <laughs> mine and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Next verse. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wickedness and will. See, see what God's saying? He says, It's not going to be somebody else teaching you about God. It's going to be God himself teaching you. He's going to write his words on your heart, and you are going to know me from the least to the greatest. I'm going to invite you into the presence of God so that you fellowship with me one-on-one, that our hearts and our connection will be one-to-one, not between a priest and somebody else. Now, as you read in the book, people have funny things they think about priests. I remember my dad when he was a Lutheran pastor. I, do you remember the robes that he wore, the black robe? It looked like Batman, kind of. He had this robe, and it was all thing, and I, I thought as a kid, like, it's kind of weird, you know, seeing your dad like that all of a sudden, like, why is he wearing that black robe? It's kind of weird. He doesn't wear that at home. At least, I didn't see him. <laughs> but we have funny ideas about what a priest is. We think it's a Catholic thing, right, Brett? Where are you, Brett? He's out somewhere out there. He's out there talking. We think it's a Catholic thing, but yet in the scripture, he's basically saying priests are the ones who have 
access to God. And in our mind, whether we would admit it or not, many of us think of this when we think of priests. We think of somebody who's qualified to be in the presence of the Lord. And then secondly, we think, well, I'm not qualified. I'm not a pastor. I'm not a priest. Uh, I, I have no credentials of being able to just come boldly into the presence of God. That's, that's for holy people. You know, I mean, you hear people say, well, you know, pray at dinner. Well, let's have the pastor pray because, you know, he has a direct line to God, you know. His phone and his spirit to God is more direct than mine is. We'll have him pray, right? That's, that's not what the scripture teaches. The scripture teaches that you have direct access to God. You have direct access to God anytime, any place. Any of you do. And that's the teaching. That's the, the breakthrough. That's the revolution that Jesus brought. Now bring up this next scripture, if you will, Sarah, because this is the scripture in Hebrews that talks about what Jesus did to start this revolution. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence, we have confidence to enter the most holy place, that's where the priests were able to go once a year to give sacrifice, and it was all walled off, nobody else could go in there but them. We have confidence now, all of us, to enter the most holy place by what? By the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God. Say it with me. Draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Isn't that good? We have confidence to enter the presence of God as priests because of what Christ did in sacrificing his body. His sacrifice now was that the Lamb of God, the offering that the priest would give to atone for sin, was made by Christ. Now there's no sacrifice on our part. It's only to respond to the sacrifice that Jesus gave. Gave And in a moment, I'll talk a little bit later on about what that kind of looks like for us now. Now, to say all of that, are you ready now for the main course? It's not going to be super long, but it's the main course. Turn to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, and I want you to go there with me. John chapter 4 is an awesome passage about the woman at the well. I didn't realize, I haven't read it within the context of priesthood and what God is trying to convey, but as I thought about it, I realized that Jesus is now setting the stage with this woman to basically not only touch her spiritually, but to invite her in as a person who is qualified to be in the presence of God. And all the things about the breakthrough and revolution that Jesus was bringing is all in this story. Basically, Jesus is meeting with a woman at a well. Not in a synagogue, not in a church, not in a special place of worship, just in an ordinary place called a well where people came every day. And Jesus was going to show her and teach her that worship happens between two people and it doesn't have to be in a certain place anymore. It doesn't have to be in a special place. It's kind of like when you drive out of here today in your car, the presence of God can fall as you're driving out as you worship him. You didn't have to be here. You didn't have to come to faith fellowship to worship him. It can happen when you're taking a shower. You should take a shower. <laughs> it can happen at work. It can happen at any place. And the second thing, it can happen in the most unusual time. Or the most normal time. You're doing dishes, ladies. You're working on the cars, men, if you do. Or whatever your project is. And all of a sudden, you're doing a duty that you do all the time. And boom, the presence of God comes. Here she is, and what are they doing at this well? 
They're doing what they do every time. They come at a certain time of the day, and they draw water. And I bet she had no idea that something was going to co come special out of that moment that happens every day for her, probably. You follow? The Holy Spirit shows up sometimes when the things that we do every day, we take for granted, we're just going about our business, we're commuting to work, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit taps us on the shoulder and says, I want you to worship me right now. You're going, oh, that was weird. I wasn't expecting that. I'm just going about my business. And that's what was happening in this story. Jesus comes, the woman at a, at a well, a normal place, at a particular time of the day she comes, and Jesus comes there, and basically she says, as we'll see in a moment, she goes, why would you come and offer me a drink of water? After all, I'm, no, I'm number one, I'm a Samaritan, in other words, I'm not worthy. And number two, I'm a woman. Why is a rabbi talking to a woman right now? And we see, do you see what's happening here? He's reinforcing this idea that even she, as a Samaritan and as a woman, and even her at a place like at a well, and at a time when she just comes and does her normal routine, God can invite you into his presence. God can come and draw you in. Now, let's just read that with that context in mind. The Samaritan woman, verse 9, said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For the Jews do not associate with the Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, who it was that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you what? Living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, anyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him, notice that, will become in him. In him, a spring of water, doing what in the NIV? Welling up to eternal life. Notice that. Welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I won't have to get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. And he told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you are now with is not your husband. What you have said, just said, is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. In other words, Jesus just gave a word of knowledge right there. He knew, by the Spirit of God, her past, even though he had never met her before. That in Corinthians is called a word of knowledge. God gave information, Jesus had information that he could not have known unless the Spirit of God gave that. And I've seen that happen many times. And he begins to speak into her life about something that she goes, man, I guess that's weird. You must be a prophet or something because prophets are the ones who speak on behalf of God. They know things that other people don't know, right? Right? Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, notice. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, believe me, a woman, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet, notice, yet, a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you 
am he. Here's what makes us as a royal priesthood possible. First of all, Jesus comes to be the sacrifice, to be the Lamb of God. And when he died, what happened in the temple? The curtain that separated us from the presence of God, right, was what happened to the curtain? It was torn as a symbol that we now can go into the presence and holy place that Scripture talked about in Hebrews 10. That shaking that happened at his death caused the curtain to be rend and the curtain to be torn as a symbolic act for us now to go into the presence of God. And now what ignites what he's telling this woman is that you're being invited into this being a priest and how it's going to happen, how it's going to be ignited is that I am going to place within you the Holy Spirit. He's saying the Holy Spirit's going to come and he's going to well up in you. There's going to be something that happens inside of you. The place of where you meet with God is not going to be on a mountain over there. It's not going to be over there where the Jews say it's going to happen. It's going to happen in the heart of a person. It's going to happen in a woman at a well drawing water in a normal everyday circumstance. You're going to encounter the presence of God because the Spirit of God is going to live in you. And everywhere you go, you will have an opportunity to come into the presence of God anytime, at any place. Not only do we not understand what it really is, how awesome and how amazing and life-changing it is to be a priest before God, we have taken for granted that the presence of God now lives in here. And Jesus said later in John, out of your innermost being will flow Rivers of living water. Something will happen inside of you. And you don't have to find a place for it to happen. You just have to open your heart to say, Jesus, come and move in me. Stir in me. I'm hungry for your anointing. I'm hungry for your presence. I'm longing for the Spirit of God to be released in me. I know you live there, but I, I want the touch of God in greater measure. And I believe, church, if I know anything about the generosity and goodness and desire of God, is that he wants that more than you do. He wants it more than you do. He, he's drawing you in and he's asking for you to respond. As he is this woman, we are like the woman at the well. He's saying, if you get a taste of this, you won't have a taste for the world anymore. You'll desire the things of God more than you can even imagine. Just watch what happens when the Spirit of God begins to move. True worshipers will worship in spirit. It can happen any place, any time. But the second part of the equation is worship in spirit and in truth. He's telling the woman and he's telling us that worship happens in the heart, but it also happens in from the heart. You can have the Spirit of God. You can come here every Sunday to church and sing the songs and look like you're spiritual and look like your heart's engaged with God, but it might not be because it's not coming from your heart. Why did Jesus ask this woman about the husband's? Because to be a priest before God, you have to worship in truth. In other words, God calls us to sacrifice ourself. We're called to bring to God our lives as a what? Living sacrifice. We surrender our will to God. That's the part we surrender. That's the part we sacrifice. In other words, you can't worship God by just saying you worship God if it's not actually happening honestly in here. If it's not coming from here, Jesus said it to the 
Pharisees, the people who were still doing it on the outside, pretending their worship on the outside, but still walking in rebellion on the inside. He said, you honor me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. And so he's basically saying, don't tell me that you want to worship God if you don't want to be obedient in your heart to him. Don't tell me that you love God and aren't going to keep his commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And that, my friends, is what priests do. They keep the commands of God and they worship in truth. In other words, they're honest about where their heart is. Is it really surrendered to God? Or am I just going through the motions? We can look good to a lot of people. We can fool a lot of people, but you can't fool God. That woman said, I don't have a husband. He's saying, yeah, you know what? You've had five. Ooh. Uh, ooh. All of a sudden, God begins to expose what's really there. And he's asking this question. Are you going to be honest with me and let me know that your heart is mine? Because when you do that, that's when you're really worshiping. The Spirit of God can live in you, but if your heart's not surrendered, you're still living your own life, then you're really not worshiping the Lord because you're not worshiping in truth. You're being dishonest. You're hiding your heart, and you're not invited into his presence. So my challenge to you as her is, we need to worship in spirit and in truth. Do I have just a few more minutes? Ooh, it's a long time, sorry. I want to share one last thing with you. If we can bring up that scripture in Acts, if we could. Acts 16, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose and the jailer woke up when he saw the prison doors open and he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas and then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be. And later on it says that the jailer brought them in and it says that their whole family and whole household were saved. Now, I want to ask you this question. I asked the, the leaders on a Sunday morning months ago. I said, why did Paul and Silas worship the Lord in prison? Was it because they heard a tape message or a pastor talk about how to praise God so you could get free? Was it they went on to some Christian station and watched a pastor get up and talk about, you know, if you really want to be free in Christ, you need to learn how to praise him. So just start praising him and watch what God does and all that kind of stuff, well, th which is partially true. But it's not completely accurate because I think Paul and Silas was learning how to worship God in any place at any time because of who they were. They were learning that because they were priests before God, they could worship God in a prison cell. Didn't matter where they were. And right in the middle of the crazy stuff that was going on, they could offer praises up to God. And God, as he often does, inhabits the praises of his people and sometimes and often will do miraculous things to bring a release and a freedom that happens in that moment of despair and hurt and sorrow. It's called in Hebrews chapter 13, a sacrifice of praise. It's easy to praise God when he's doing what we think he should be doing. Wow, thank you, God. Have you heard those people talking about their praise reports? Anybody have a praise report? Yeah, I got a new job. Hallelujah. Not too hard to praise him right there, is it? Anybody else have a praise report? Yeah, my marriage was healed. Everybody goes, yes, praise God for that. Isn't God wonderful? Everybody starts jumping up and down. People even start dancing. Anybody else have a praise report? Yes, 
I was in debt and God set me free and my great grandmother gave me $100,000. Praise God, everybody goes crazy. And all these things that God has done for us, we praise him for. We call it a praise report. But what is a sacrifice of praise? What is it that we bring because we're priests of God when he doesn't do what we expect him to do? And when we want to look at it and say, you know, God, you're not doing your job description here. You're not fulfilling your end of the deal. My friend, my wife, my somebody died of cancer. My marriage blew up. My kids are walking away from God, whatever it might be. There's a million things. My finances are in the tank, and you see no solution. A sacrifice of praise then is not because God's done something. It's because you know who he is anyway. He is the Lord of lords and King of kings. He's sovereign. He's powerful. And he's, he's not changing, even though your circumstances might be changing. And all of a sudden you realize, you know what? It doesn't matter if I'm in prison, in a prison cell. This is awful. I'm going to praise him anyway. I'm going to worship him anyway. Here's the thing I want to say. Don't pretend. Don't fake it. Don't act like it's not hard. It's not difficult. When our hearts are broken, when life doesn't make sense, when our, just, our burdens are heavy, we don't sit there and go, oh, praise God, and have a smile on our face like that doesn't matter. David didn't do that in the Psalms. He says, my soul is just ripped in half. But then he goes, but somehow, some way, God is still on the throne. And I worship him. Watch how David then begins to move into a place of worship and praise. Not because of what God has done, but because of who he is. And that is the sacrifice of praise. That's what priests do. That's the sacrifice that we bring now. Because we don't want to do that. We're devastated inside, and it's the last thing we feel like doing is praising him in the middle of that. But you know what? As a priest of God, you don't have the option. You are called to do it as a priest before God to bring sacrifice of praise, no matter what. You aren't going like, you know, well, I'm just not that spiritual. I'm sorry, you're a priest of God. That's what you do. That's what you're called to do. And when God does that, then amazing, miraculous things can begin to overflow. Let me just close with this. Whew. I've told this story before, but for many of you it's new. If you've been around, uh, in 1995, my first missions trip, I was 40 years old, I left to go to Romania for five weeks. Back in the day when cell phones didn't really hardly exist, you couldn't even get a phone conversation back home. I really basically was cut off from my family basically for five weeks. I think Danae was probably four or five years old. When I left, she was bawling. It was just a difficult time, and I just recently was praying for somebody. They're going to go somewhere, and I said, you know what? The most lonely time I ever had was going to Romania in 1995, but it was the most richest, most deepest, most powerful time that I had as a person coming into the presence of God. I had so many moments where I felt alone and by myself, but yet God was so completely present and powerfully there. I remember we were down by the border of Romania. We had flown into Switzerland, drove through Austria, into Hungary, a couple a day to drive, and we got into the border, and something happened with the paperwork for the vehicle we were driving. And Arnie and Carolyn Halverson, of who we have supported for years as missionaries to Romania, they were driving in with this vehicle, and Arnie wasn't always known for details. So we get to the border, and the border people come out, and they basically say, uh, we have problems with your vehicle. You can't get into Romania. And, you know, conversations going back and forth, difficulty with, difficulty with interpretations and all that kind of stuff. Come to find out, we're sitting there. We're tired, we're overwhelmed, we've been traveling. I'm in a different country across the other side of the world. I'm kind of feeling like out there, kind of like exposed. Arnie and Carolyn, they're like, 
clued faces. And I remember the feeling of like, what if we're stuck here? I don't know if you've ever been traveling to a place. Now, we're talking about Romania just come out of communism, out of Ceausescu in 1989, so not very far fr removed from crazy stuff that was happening over there. Not like some of our team that went over way recently. It was like feeling like, what if I never get out of this place? You know what I'm saying? What if I never go back to my family? And what if we can't get in? What are we going to do? Did we come all this way for now? All this flood of stuff came tumbling down upon me and upon us. We sat there and went, what's going to happen? I felt this heaviness and this despair. And I don't even know who started it. I don't know if it was Arnie or I, but Arnie Howerson and I have been around for a long time, and all of a sudden we started singing songs. We sang a song, and then another song would come. And it was like the Holy Spirit said, push play on a playlist. And we just started singing song after song after song. And it started slowly. We'd sing a song. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we have the victory. We're kind of going, uh, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, demons will have to flee, amen. When we stand on the name of Jesus, tell me who can stand before in the name of Jesus, Jesus. We have the victory. You remember that one, Arnie? Yeah, I remember that one. And he would say, how about this one? We'd sing another one, and we're starting to get excited. And you remember this one? And all of a sudden, we're pounding the dashboard. Yeah. We sense the presence of God coming. This heaviness that is upon us begins to lift. We begin to just shake that van around. I mean, we're pounding. And literally, we felt the manifest presence in the border to Romania, any place, at any time, with just us people there, the presence and anointing of the, of the Holy Spirit came upon us. And before long, within a half hour, hour, I tell you what, I can remember it specifically this day. The presence of God was so thick, so powerful, so wonderful. I'll never forget it. God just came in those moments and overwhelmed us welled up in us, spring forth in us in an unusual and amazing ways. And we drove away. We didn't know how it was going to be fixed, but we just knew it was fixed. And I'm telling you, we had such joy. We were so excited. And we were talking about, we were laughing and clapping. and It's like, it was crazy. People were probably like, what's with that? Americans, that's crazy. Pastor Randy and Pastor Eric, would you come up here? I'm really sorry I went this way long. I want you to stand. Larry, if you come. For a long time, I've longed and hungered for more of the Spirit of God because I've seen it, I've tasted and seen, and I'm hungry. I'm still hungry after all these years. I'm still longing for, still desiring, still wanting people to have a dashboard banging, clapping, hopping, joyful, overwhelming experience of the Holy Spirit that they could never ever, ever dismiss other than that was God. That was God. So clear, so powerful. And I've asked these pastors to come because I think there are people in here today that need to learn how to praise him and worship him anytime the Spirit of God moves. There's people in here that need to be aware that when you're open, 
God can show up any time. And he can do it with anyone. And lastly, you need to do it, praise him, no matter what. You need to worship him no matter where you are. And no matter how hard it is, you need to give that sacrifice of praise. And I'm here to tell you, I don't know if you'll do it every time, but I know by experience, when you do that many times, God shows up, provides the fullness of his presence like you've never experienced or felt it before. There is a true welling up. There is this true spirit of God coming down upon us that we long and desire for. And I just want you to put your hand up. If you hear this today and you say, God, I want an overflow. I want a fresh touch of the Spirit of God. I want to I want to have full access to all that God has, all that God brings. I want to not be in the way in any way shape or form. I want to be ready at any time and at any place to say, God, I'll worship you. And it doesn't matter what I'm going through. I'm just going to worship you. And I'm ready, God, for a new move of God on my life. I'm ready for more of the Spirit of God. I know what it's like to walk with him, but I want that springing up. I want that coming down upon. I want that anointing. I want that blessing of God. I want you to ask him right now, if your hand's raised, I want you to ask him right now, and Pastor Annie and Pastor Eric and I, we're going to extend our hands to you, and we're going to pray for you this morning. God, we're going to ask that in this place, God, beginning today, as we go out of these doors today, we're going to pray for more of the Spirit of God. We're going to expect God for you to show up when we don't expect it. We're going to expect God for you to do it in places we never dreamt could happen. And we're going to do it, Lord God, no matter what. Because, Lord God, that's who we are. We are priests of God. We worship you like that because of who we are. And we're going to ask God that again you would come and move in this place. And we be known as a place that the Spirit of God is longed for and welcomed. And we're coming to give sacrifice of praise and do whatever's necessary to see you come. And to see you move in a mighty way. I pray, God, that you would fill people that are hungry. I pray that you'd fill people that are hungry, Lord. I pray that you would fill people that are hungry for you, God. Just talk to him for just a moment, and then we're going to close. Just tell the Lord this as we close. To your best ability, say, yes, Lord. You may not even know how to get there yet, but could you just say yes to the Lord? Your sacrifice is, Lord, I'm going to say yes to whatever you have. I'm going to say yes. And we're going to be a church, a place that says yes. No more no, no more tomorrow, no more next week. Yes, right now, today, we say yes to you. And may God be the blessing of God. May his faithfulness, may his sovereign power and majesty rest on every single person as we leave today. In Jesus' name, give him praise right now, church. Give him praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We worship your name, Lord.